Hi, this is Eva Haining, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of what we've been working on with a new series called World Builder. And thanks for joining me today. I am going to stop sharing on one screen and start to give you another look at what we've been working on today. So this is a little bit of what I've been working on. Hi, my name is Eva Haining. It's a pleasure to see you all. And uh, for those of you I haven't met before, um, I'm a creator, producer. I work in both metaverse and media production, and I create a wide variety of virtual experiences, events, uh, playability across public spaces. Um, I also do innovation sprints, and I've worked with cities on how to implement different types of green cities initiatives. So what we're going to be looking at, and I'm going to start adding different things to the stream here, are different experiments that I've been running in a tool called Cities Skylines. So Cities Skylines is a amazing and very interesting uh, game that's been out for about five years. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the Cities Skylines experience like, uh, but we're especially going to talk about how to use this tool to run different types of experiments and, and to try different types of things at home. So I'm going to hop off screen, but you're going to hear me throughout the course of this journey. And we're going to talk about some of the decisions that were made in building this city of about 190,000 people over the course of of um, just a few days. So uh, this is the type of something we call the digital twin. And in this case, this is a digital twin, um, but uh, not of a fully uh, existing city. This is of a prototype city. So as a world builder, sometimes I build fictional cities, sometimes I build virtual sets that match physical ones, um, and I also write stories. Some of them take place in near future environments where I want to play out different scenarios. So what you're seeing here and the beginnings of uh, this journey is of a town called Wilder. And Wilder is the set for a series that I've been writing. It's also a place where I run different experiments in the City Skylines tool. So uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about City Skylines. You're going to find uh, any information you want about that via their website. So City Skylines is published by a team at Paradox, and uh, they are all over the world. Uh, up, but certainly based all over the world. And uh, this is in-game footage of a city that I built uh, about a week ago now. Um, I took about a day or so to build out this city, to model it out as a test case for the set I need for the show I've been working on. And specifically, uh, to build the world in a way that I could walk in it, I could play different characters, I could import uh, my vehicles and my buildings and my people uh, to maybe play out some ideas. Now, this is a prototype, but what we're going to be talking about today specifically is like how to use these types of tools to maybe solve problems that you're facing in your own city, right? So uh, you're going to see things like buses and multimodal transit. You're going to see different types of challenges uh, that cities hit, both in terms of climate action, uh, but also in making uh, green cities decisions for their community. Now, uh, I don't know which platforms we're live on and which ones are not working today. So what I'm going to do is do my best to make this available on the Playable Agency website later. You can hit me up at Playable Agency anytime you'd like. And uh, for those of you I haven't connected with before, it's great to meet you for the first time. So in this build, uh, this is my seventh city in the city skylines game. 
uh, Wilder I did within the uh, Steam on PC over the course of a little bit over a day. And the main DLC that we're going to be discussing is the Green Cities DLC within it. So uh, not all of the Green Cities uh, pieces were implemented, and obviously very few were. Um, but again, this is the seventh city I've built, and in each case we try different things. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about decentralized power solutions. Um, uh, in future episodes, we're going to talk a little bit more about cleaner cities and uh, how to address pollution and how to address some of the other solutions there. But if you wanted to try something like this at home, you could do this on Xbox PlayStation or uh, in the Steam uh, market. You can check out the Steam Workshop for a number of mods. And there aren't a lot of mods used in this build. This is what we call mostly the vanilla build. But you are going to see a handful of uh, pretty interesting solutions, some of which were imported from the creators in the Steam Workshop community. So uh, thanks to those creators, and I want to give them all a shout out. Um, we're going to go into this build a little bit later on, and you'll see a little bit of what that looks like. Um, but at first, just to step back, I want you to be able to get a sense of what these kinds of cities look like, uh, what they do, and uh, get a little bit about how we use them as well. So um, I have been leading different types of community processes for deliberation on climate action, on green cities design, um, and on solutions for uh, partnerships between public and private institutions for about 15 years. Uh, I've worked in government, I've worked in nonprofits. Uh, I've also worked as a consultant and I've helped lead sprints in different cities, uh, both in the US and down in uh, South America, in uh, Medellin and Montenegro. And we'll look a little bit at the experiments we did in, in uh, South America, for example, a little bit later on. So um, my personal lens as a producer and as a technologist is to look for uh, solutions that take permaculture in mind. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what permaculture means in the course of like digital games and why that matters. But in this case, we're talking a lot about how to apply ideas about climate action. So for example, a shift to all clean energy instead of the smokestacks you see there right now, right? This particular neighborhood in this community is polluted. Why is that? Well, there is an industrial zone nearby. Can we change the industrial zone to be less polluting? And what are the policy choices we make to do that? So we're gonna talk a little bit about those policy decisions, um, both from an in-game kind of modeling perspective, but also from a real world perspective uh, so that you can understand the differences between those. So um, obviously city skylines is a key. So some of the aspects of this model do work very well for experimentation. Let's say you're trying to see the, the, the resource exchange, or maybe you're trying to see from a purely design perspective, you want to do like a design charrette with your community, um, or maybe you want to run something with your university or your school. Um, lots of universities around the world have already built uh, what we call digital twins of their city. And I would encourage you again to go to the Steam Workshop and check out some of those cities. Uh, I think there are like 40,000 maps there, including many physical cities where you can build on the topography of the place that you live. So uh, you don't necessarily have to be you know, building a fictional world. In this case, we're building something that's sort of a hybrid between a, a fictional world and maybe the world we, we want to see. Uh, in this case, in this town of Wilder, uh, it's sort of a proto-European city. Um, you're going to see street signs and certain types of things that might clue you in that this is a, a European city. Um, but it could be anywhere. You just change the signs out, you change out things like billboards or, or the signage on buses. And all of those things you do have control over within the, the crater tools within this uh, City Skylines uh, crater pack itself. So um, please 
by the way, ignore where my building skills are still getting refined. This was again done in about a day. So we're talking about a city of 190,000 modeled out. And as you've seen those people and vehicles going around, those are all uh, sort of individual non-player characters or you know, an aspect of the AI of the game itself. So we are looking at some of the flow dynamics of the cities and communities at work, right? So much of the gameplay for some folks turns to be around uh, traffic flow or what we would refer to as multimodal transit. So you've seen maybe buses here, but there are metro stations, ferry stations, an airport, uh, there are five different transit solutions that people can access. And one of the decisions I chose to make very early on that's uh, not common for people in this game, but I found useful, is to make all of those solutions free. So uh, this city has a bit less of the traffic problems that some modern cities currently have, uh, but that is because we've made all public transit free. And that includes things like a monorail to the airport or uh, something like the, the buses and, and tours and different types of things that go around town. So one of the other things you're gonna notice here is multimodal transit for an AI becomes this sort of automatic thing. It knows where it wants to go. It finds the best possible path. And then you're basically watching 100,000 non-player characters sort out their traffic problems and you become the, the sort of mayor or the you know benevolent dictator uh, so to speak of your community um that is obviously different than how most places are actually run um we don't necessarily just have one person making all the decisions for an entire city we have uh, people who get upset and, and have deliberative process that they want to work out uh, I happen to live in the town of Oakland, California. So you're gonna see things like redwoods and beautiful bridges across bays that look a little bit like the Bay Area. Um, but you're also going to look at something like bicycle lanes. And, and bicycle lanes are something that here in California are often hotly contested. Uh, bicycle lanes change the nature of deliveries. And, and a lot of these vehicles on the, the road are delivery vehicles right they're they're bringing you your dinner they're making cargo happen to the, to the stop so when we're thinking about bicycle lanes we're also thinking about how those interface with the multimodal transit solutions right so now that we're at the ferry do your ferry stops the multimodal transit solutions fit with your bicycle lanes and your walking paths and we're going to take a look a little bit more at what that looks like so I'm going to bring in a different stream and what I want you to be able to see as we begin to do some little more sort of big picture thinking about how cities work, how they share resources, how they make decisions together. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the relationships of those resources. So. Um, Stepping back again, uh, this is a process that every city develops differently in real life. We happen to be flying over a prototype city where I happen to be making all the decisions about where everything goes, down to every last water pipe in town, right? I get to decide that we are all clean energy and we don't use fossil fuels. We only use electric cars. We only use wind, solar, and geothermal. Right? So the relationship of those resources is really only up to me in this scenario. Now, in a, in a real city, there are lots of stakeholders who want to help make those decisions with us, right? And the deliberative process around that can be a place where using models like what we're doing here in City Skylines can help us figure out the relationship between communities, people, and the resources that we need to manage together because these are our sort of shared assets in the community. Um, what this game in particular starts to make apparent very quickly is that 
any number of options are valid and you have lots of solutions ahead of you. So what the footage we're looking at right now is, uh, this was maybe 24 hours into my build. I'm um, very early on, I've decided, I, I put in an amusement park at the top of the hill because I wanted people to have something fun to do together. Um, you know, we put a nice little uh, bear sanctuary and a cool little castle up there and all these beautiful, uh, what we call unique buildings and, and monuments in, in the game. So as you can see, this is earlier on. The city is not fully developed yet. Not all of those elements that were in the last few videos are here at this point. This is a city that is still uh, growing, right? Um, there are now more cities being grown around the world than we've ever seen. And there are so many happening in these very interesting planned ways that it becomes an extremely valuable place to begin running experiments. How do we want to live in the public commons together? How do we want to generate energy together? This cool little round thing here is a floating garden. Do we want floating gardens? Do we want vertical gardens? This city happens to use both, but we also have fruit fields and all of the sort of mix of traditional and permaculture solutions in a city. Now, there are lots of opportunities here to try new things, right? Not just floating gardens, but to maybe prototype the kinds of solutions you wanna see in your own city, to import that model and to see how it looks, right? Does it look good by the waterfront? Do I want this next to my Colossus statue or whatever that might be in your town? Um, what you're seeing here again, these are the assets that the game gives you pretty much. Um, at this very early stage, and this is a very rough slide through, I apologize. But the key that I want you to be thinking about in your own city design is how do you mix those resources in a way that comes into play, that feels balanced for the kind of place that you wanna create. Now, we live in cities right now that are not in balance, that are flawed and awkward and weird, um, that are maybe decades behind the times when it comes to climate action and in making clean choices around not just clean energy and how we move around the city, but also in the basics, like how do we happen to share resources? How do we talk about that? Is there a public park and can we enjoy it together? So what you're seeing now are some of those choices and how they come into play. Some of that is about zoning and how we put things together in a city. And when you're thinking about this for yourself, you get to choose how you put elements together. You can notice that the port and the harbor are, are slightly polluting, but the industrial zone is very polluting. And maybe you don't want to invest your, your resources or your energy or your money or your budget into those solutions. So, what you just saw there, all those people were running into a metro station. Do you want to spend a lot more money and run tunnels throughout your city so that you have less traffic, maybe less pollution, more public transit? Uh, all of these are the decisions that real city planners and city builders make, um, often in a way that is not transparent, in the sense that it's very rarely uh, that the, that the public gets to have a say in how these things are going to work. So uh, I'm going to show you a little bit, we're gonna, we're gonna jump ahead here a little bit. And you can see the sort of dynamics that are normal to a city, not just cargo holds and emergency vehicles and making sure that you know a city is fully, uh, again, balanced for the types of things that its community is going to need. Um, but maybe you don't want to fund your police and maybe you want to run an experiment where you completely defund the police and see what happens. Whether the AI is accurate in that simulation is anybody's guess. I can tell you from my experiments, this AI is only accurate in certain types of dynamics. It is not accurate around education at all. Um, it can be somewhat accurate around certain types of uh, how traffic flow works.
works, um, but it's also idealized. So in some ways, this city looks more like what we would see uh, with a whole city of self-driving cars that happen to all be electric, right? So maybe this looks like 2040, where a city has tried to move the needle, but hasn't fully gotten there yet. And because we are going to be in this sort of awkward, you know, post-collapse uh, experience for some cities. And in other cities, it's going to be a far more sort of protopian experience. Lots of gardens, solar panels on every roof, lots of clean energy solutions in-house so that you don't necessarily have to, uh, you know, spend all of your money on, on pollution remediation because you can also invest a little bit in a space elevator, which is what that little doohickey seems to be. So um, maybe you want to build a, a, a space industry and focus on, on IT and high tech. Um, maybe you want to figure out how to do other types of things. This is one type of experimentation zone that happens to run uh, through the Unity game engine, um, but it's a fairly robust way to run a DIY digital twin. So again, when we were talking about digital twins earlier, digital twins are typically uh, models of a city that exists in the real world, um, but sometimes it's a model of a, of a country. And uh, the uh, folks at City Skylines actually just ran a really fun live stream, uh, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, where they ran it a little like a game show where you would look at the footage and based on the quality of the digital twin, you were able to uh, pick up which city it was and identify it, right? So in some cases, these digital twins are extremely accurate and it's really all you put into it. If you want to go and scan the buildings in your town and upload them, um, here again, you're seeing a city that is building, a work in progress. So there's construction happening. There's gardens being built. There's people putting gardens on their roof. And those, again, are the types of choices that people are making, not only to rethink permaculture in the city, but, but to also kind of give people a way to galvanize and do things together. So um, permaculture is one of those things that most folks haven't spent a lot of time thinking about. And uh, I'm gonna try and upload a really great image that I found uh, just recently from a friend, um, but this was actually published a couple of years ago. So uh, permaculture really thinks about the whole ecosystem and how these elements are coming together. So if you're taking a look at this map, and this is from an article that uh, Ruth Glendening did in Neighborhood Economics, and thanks to our friends at Neighborhood Economics for that. Um, but you can see that these are feedback loops and, and ecosystems that all feed each other. And so we're thinking about the food, the resources, all of the natural elements as being intertwined and being really vital to each other's growth. So um, in cities, with, that looks like lots of things. That looks like the loss of bees in the city. Um, that might look like lots of community gardens. Um, and early on for me, that looked like planting lots of trees and making room for lots of parks, making lots of green space in the city. And now this city is not the most forested city I've built. I can say that every city has as many trees as possible. Now, this is early on, but you'll notice that by the end, as I'm gonna go to a different video, it starts to become far more lush. Um, again, these are choices we can make in real time in our city. So you can use these types of games, City Skylines being one great example, to figure out what would my city look like if we doubled the amount of trees in it? What would, uh, you know, Los Angeles did a million trees project that they didn't quite uh, make, but they, they did a valiant effort, planted I think 400,000 trees. Um, what would your city look like if you planted a million trees in it? Um, these are the kinds of experiments that uh, a robust digital twin of your city can let you run. So, 
These kinds of simulations are fairly detailed and you can go and walk through all of the maps and all of the elements. Um, but I'm gonna show you a little bit more right now from the screen share itself and, because I wanna walk you through the city and I wanna give you a sense of what it looks like as you're doing it. So I'm gonna go into city skylines here and those screenshots I was showing you are all from here and you can see I've got a water disaster on my hands. So all of those notes are telling me that I've got a water crisis and I've got people moving out of downtown because of it, right? They can't get water, they've got a problem, they're gonna leave. So why do they have a water problem? Well, there's a number of problems going on here. I'm gonna give you Number one, we're gonna do some daylight options here. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of how I have this configured. And in this game, you can change, for example, a pretty wide variety of things. Um, but you can also uh, set up certain things um, as far as like whether you want it to be a day and night or not. You can set up the shadows and shadow quality. Um, you can do a number of different things that sort of customize the experience um, and the viewability. So we're gonna come on sunrise here and I believe we are currently in the uh, sort of evening time. But uh, this town is built on two canals. And like many cities, uh, Los Angeles, for example, uh, the river dried up and we are in a drought. Uh, California is in uh, a drought like we uh, don't even know what to do. There are massive fires not uh, 100 miles from me right now uh, that have destroyed whole cities. And we know that uh, power lines, for example, have caused previous fires. We know that failures in our energy system have caused previous fires. So these are very real and pressing issues in my community um, as we try and figure out, well, how can we live together in a way that is perhaps more viable and, and less resist, less, uh, less fragile? I, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the book Anti-Fragile, but Thinking about resiliency in terms of how can I make my community as resilient as possible. Uh, that includes things like uh, community gardens and bicycle lanes and composting and getting off of fossil fuels and putting solar panels on our roof and all of these kinds of ideas. But it also means maybe we don't waste as much water. Maybe we rethink our resource use across the board. Um, and that's decisions made at the city level, but that's also decisions made um, at these sort of micro levels, right? So I'm gonna zoom in on some of these decisions, right? And what those decisions mean. Now, I've got a water problem to solve. And this is usually like the point in the game where you would freak out because what's happening is this river has become a dried up canal. So I had ferries running here for transit along here, this whole corridor. And what happened was the whole thing dried up because I put an extra water source up the way. And this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you find in experiments. It looks like a robust river and it, you would think that everything is gonna be fine. This is a, like a little water treatment. Uh, this is a little water pump that's bringing water to the communities. So I would think that it should be able to pull the water. But what happened was it dried up the entire canal for the rest of the city and created water shortages throughout the whole region of downtown, which is now becoming desolate and people are moving out. So we lost 30,000 people in our town while we were doing this stream. And this is why running an experiment and doing some modeling matters. So let's say your town is approached by uh, someone who wants to start pumping the water to make bottled water. Uh, let's say that contract looks really great. You could build more schools and all sorts of things, 
But when you do the rest of the testing, the rest of the analysis, you realize that, oh my goodness, it's going to dry up our aquifers. We're not going to have enough drinking water. We're not going to have, you know, capacity for our city. And so these are the trade-offs that real cities like, like us in California have to do on a regular basis. And this, this town is a really great test case because you can see like all of downtown, it was populated a week ago and now it's gone. And this is all because of one bad water choice. Now, we're gonna look a little bit at the policies that go into these kinds of choices too, because I want you to get a sense of how this all fits together um, in terms of helping you run experiments, but also in, in thinking about how these experiments can be applied. So this game allows you to do some fairly robust districting, and in that you can make some decisions about a number of policies. So you can see I have these sort of districts lined up and some of them are residential, some of them are more commercial, there's an IT, a downtown region. And this downtown region has got some real problems with resources, particularly getting the water that they need. Now I've already done what we call water usage, uh, which is asking to uh, improve our sustainability measures throughout the city. And that's somewhat about uh, public community conversations and PR and all of the sorts of things that go into stakeholder engagement in citizen work. Um, but some of that has to go with putting water meters in or maybe charging people a little bit more so they use a little less or having a time when you don't water your lawns and you ask people to take shorter showers, that kind of thing. So these policies I, I already have in place, it's not enough running out of water, we're drying up. What do we do, right? This is where the experiments become super valuable because you can do any number of types of things to see, well, okay, if I can't pump more water from the river over there, maybe, maybe, maybe I could try pumping from another place. So this town has two canals. The problem has been that either canal, if I start to pump from it, you can see it's already like a pretty small canal and it dries up. Now we have these bays out here where the cruise ships come in, where the cargo comes in. And so this is like your port. And if you're pulling drinking water from your port, this is not necessarily going to be your cleanest drinking water. And you know, many cities have problems with clean drinking water for various reasons. In this game, they generally warn you to keep your water as far away from anything that looks like these, the water treatment solutions. Now, each of these are what they call an eco water treatment plant. That does not mean that they are clean. They certainly have like a pollution bubble around them. And I can do a number of things to visualize what that looks like. And so I can see, well, part of the problem is I never connected this whole set here to the rest of the grid, right? So here's the water and that's the water treatment. But if I look at the pollution, this is where things start to get a little wonky. So you can see I have a number of different indicators health, happiness, uh, traffic levels, which are pretty fascinating. Pollution is not necessarily showing that there's massive pollution here, but the water is becoming polluted from everything that's going into it. So at the end of the day, I can't put anything resulting in clean drinking water from that site. So what I did was I tried putting some things up here See what happened was no power, no water, dried up. So I can move all four of these to where the water source is again. And they might work for a little bit, or they might completely dry up. And we just don't know. So that's where like running the experiment is really important especially if you happen to be in a role in your community where you need to help make these decisions. 
Um, or you just happen to be a, a concerned citizen and you care about what happens to your water supply. Um, I have definitely lived in cities where I chose to move because I did not trust that the water supply was going to be okay. And honestly, in, in a fire heavy region like Northern California in the midst of a drought, this is something that I think about all the time. So you can see, I just made a bunch of water available. I'm hopeful that pumping this means that we solve this problem over here and they're not gonna be upset anymore. And everybody's gonna have water and they're not gonna die. Yeah, so those alarm buttons went off. But now what we have, what we have is a, a large number of people, sort of like the city of Flint, who either had to choose to use bottled water or leave their homes. And, uh, you know, some cities have lived like that for a long period of time for various reasons, whether it's pollution in the drinking water or other solutions. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the types of uh, clean energy solutions that come into play in these environments. But I wanted you to see how the decisions that you make across the ecosystem matter. And it really, you know, it doesn't matter if we're talking about like a solar panel or a landfill or the sort of industrial pieces of your city. All of those things have a relationship to each other and they, they all matter. So um, I know that we're running kind of long. I'm not gonna run this stream all day, but I would love to hear your questions about the different types of uh, city solutions we see, especially, and not just in city skylines, but across all different platforms. So I'm gonna add some of the videos from earlier, and I want you to get a sense of what that looks like when, again, putting yourself in the shoes of someone in your town, going through the city, thinking about these decisions together. Do you want more bike lanes? Are you gonna be the person who hits the biker in the lane? Well, uh, I, I've been that person who got hit in the bike lane, it, it, it sucks. So maybe there's a decision point to be made there. In, in the town of Oakland, we have these sort of curbs um, and they're pretty hotly contested because they're expensive and they also affect both the bikers and the cargo. And, and these kinds of, you know, what would seem like a simple solution end up costing cities millions of dollars. Uh, and that's millions of dollars that could go to, to other things sometimes too. So uh, as you're thinking about how these kinds of experiments can be applied in your own city, you know, obviously it doesn't have to be, you know, something like, you know, multimodal transit or how to improve the, the sort of experience from, from the usability of the walking audience or the biking audience or any of that. You could be running a very different type of experiment altogether and you could choose to go through and get really detailed about what a completely solar punk future city could look like. Now, this is not the solar punk future I want. Personally, there's too much industrial here. There's a lot of sort of polluting things that I don't love in this city. And uh, while the, the city skylines, Green Cities DLC, does have a couple of different solutions that you can uh, apply. For example, uh, those really cool solar solutions we saw earlier, uh, wave generation and hydroelectric. Uh, you can try your hand at building any number of things that might support your city to make the switch to get off fossil fuels, to become uh, carbon neutral, or maybe even to be a regenerative city in some way. So there are any number of ways that you can choose to apply this in your own place. Uh, some cities like to do public design days, and that can look like, like a world cafe or a design charrette or a virtual experience where you get lots of people bringing their ideas to the table. Let's say we want more bike lanes, we want more green space, we want more uh, clean energy solutions so that we are not using coal or uh, you know other polluting, highly polluting uh, energy solutions. So. 
The Green Cities DLC is uh, the only one that we're specifically looking at. I do use the industries and other uh, DLCs in this build, but specifically, if you're looking to do the sort of climate action modeling and trying to perhaps bring your own city to a more carbon neutral place, um, this is a DLC that you can absolutely apply and try things out combined with that method of, again, using the digital twin and then capturing that media. So what you've been watching today, again, these are all pieces I captured out of City Skylines pretty early on. And so I'm going to show you a little bit. This is very early on. I'm going to rewind as much as possible here. So this is uh, day one building. You can see I haven't even zoned it yet. So there's a, a metro station there, but nothing else. And uh, those blocks that you see there are sort of beginnings of what happens to be the, the, the zoning process. So if you've ever played a game like SimCity or, or any of these sort of city builder games, you know that there are usually different designations in zoning that help you sort of uh, create that delicate balance of what your city's profile is going to be. And, and that's a part of the civic design process every city is different. You may be a port city, you may be a wilderness city, you may be big or small. Um, I've built now seven cities using city skylines in the last month. Um, the largest is a little over 200,000, um, but some cities just don't want to be huge. Uh, let's say the one I have that's tons of waterfalls and across the bay with lots of islands, uh, that one is only about 100,000 and it shouldn't necessarily get bigger unless we wanted to maybe make it too dense uh, in a way that might not work. So where we go from here, and I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit so you can see a little bit of how this experience gets laid out. So you can see here the building of roads and laying out of like different layers of the experience. In this case, it's the harbor um, and figuring out how to bring the elements together so that the traffic flows, the people flows, the public spaces and, and the spaces that need to be there for infrastructure all fit together. And so in this dynamic now, we're really exploring ideas of scarcity and abundance because the the game itself has some sort of sort of uh it has scarcity by force in that you are limited to a certain number of squares unless you're using uh sort of the expansion mods and you have a certain amount of money in most cases now for this city build, I chose to play uh, wide open with unlimited money. Um, once you've built a few cities, you can do that. And that can change the game in terms of how you choose to design a city. Because you can do what I did here and have the money to lay out and, and really build an entire city before you even really open it. Uh, what that does is it kind of breaks the model because that's not how most cities are built outside of you know a, a handful of places. Let's say you know, Abu Dhabi, there's really not that many cities that are fully built before people move in. Generally, it's a more of an organic process that happens over a few decades. Um, but you can try to do these sort of rapid city builds and rapid iterative processes where you run an experiment and see what flies. Uh, so in this case, uh, I built and laid out a good portion of the city before we got started. And um, that was in part because I wanted to get to certain types of flow states. I wanted to make uh, the industries super streamlined and ideally isolated from the communities so that they wouldn't have a lot of like problems like asthma in, in neighborhoods. You don't want too much noise pollution. You don't want too much ground uh, soil pollution. You also don't want too much air pollution. And all of those things factor into the sort of success of a city 
and, and the viability of it. So you get to choose, right? Which values are you going to design your city around? Are you going to be a clean energy city or not? Um, I tended to use a number of public spaces, parks, roads with bicycle lanes, uh, you know, really thinking about, again, not just the multimodal transit aspects of this, but also really thinking about uh, using nature as, as the toolkit, right? Thinking about how nature works. And so there's a process and, and a, a concept that has been around uh, for a number of decades, thanks to Janine Virus, uh, which is called biomimicry. And biomimicry um, is applied in a number of ways in material science and in other uh, sciences to, to, to rethink how we design, but it can also be useful in civic design itself. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that when we go into some of the overlay maps, but just to, to give you a very quick example, um, I used two different types of, I would say, patterns. Um, when I'm designing a city, I'm often thinking about tree patterns and how branches work, because that often will inform how other flows, like traffic flows, work. So trees are valuable as teachers to teach us specific types of patterns that we know work. The tree has a number of different sort of baseline structures to it. The other baseline pattern that I pick up from nature for this city is a spider web. And um, often in city design, there are a number of different cities that you'll see around the world that are extremely based on grids. Uh, grids are not something we see as much of in nature, but we do see web patterns. And, and so I was very interested in spider web patterns as neighborhood layouts, using these sort of organic, but, but still griddable uh, layouts, um, but using them to, to maybe rethink how traffic works and such. So um, this graphic is one that I developed a long time ago in terms of biomimicry in organizational system design, but I wanted you to think about how we're sort of seeding an idea and then we're sort of playing it out. And so that looks like, okay, I've seen a pattern or two. Let's see what happens if we try to apply it in this way or that way. So that is a little bit of what a spider web looks like. But honestly, where you get to the spider webs later on are more in these neighborhood designs and laying out how streets are going to look um, and figuring out like, okay, if you were gonna create a, a community garden, could it exist between all of our homes in a way that it feels cohesive to the neighborhood itself? And so there's a number of ways in which we're, again, we're just kind of learning from those permaculture principles and thinking about, okay, this is how nature works. This is how nature cooperates. A uh, city is an ecosystem. So how do I want this type of ecosystem to cooperate? Um, sometimes that means I got to demolish stuff. And sometimes that means I have to find a different way to make something happen. So I'm going to share from City Skyline again, because I want to wrap up and share with you just a little bit of how these decisions get applied. So now we're in our city, it's daytime. And uh, I wanted to give you a little sense of, of how we apply these lessons. So this is a city that is based a little bit on LA. It's based a little bit on San Francisco. It's also based a little bit on what I saw that I loved in Medellin, Colombia. And uh, Medellin, Colombia is a very pretty mountainous city. It has a sanctuary and a park on top of a hill. It has a number of features that I really love, right? And and you do get this sort of, you know, mix of industries that really make the, the place vital, but it also just has neighborhoods with lifeblood in them and, and uh, a fairly rich public transit system. Part of what I was working on at, um, at in Medellin in particular, was the um, 
innovation sprint around multimodal transit. And so I wanna show you a little bit of what that looks like. So multimodal transit in, uh, in Medellin, Colombia is a lot of taxis, uh, some buses, uh, a number of these sort of trolley tram like uh, private buses, and and then a number of other types of solutions, but very little in terms of electric vehicles or uh, biofuel vehicles. And so part of what we were working on was looking at uh, autonomous buses and shuttles, electric vehicles, and how to help transition communities. So in this case, taking a place like Rio Negro that is a beautiful covered bridge uh, in a park and putting in another type of um, permanent uh, multimodal transit solution so that people can use public transit and get around effectively. Um, I loved the cable car in Medellin and it was one of those experiences that I really enjoyed but I wanted to figure out how do you apply that effectively to a city and, and make it a valuable proposition. So uh, we ran a number of innovation sprints. This is me doing just that uh, there in uh, a beautiful green building with plants all the way up it uh, called Ruta Na in Medellin, Colombia. And so the kinds of experiments we were running were really around improving access to multimodal transit and making that super valuable and figuring out how to improve the communication system so that we could get around as easily as those AI do in the models in these places. So this is happens to be the uh, city hall in uh, Rio Negro. And I wanted you to see just a little bit of how we apply very similar ideas to the game in real life. So self-driving buses and smart paths, and also these sort of smart kiosks so that you can find out exactly where you need to go and why and make that very easy transition without a lot of fuss, without a lot of crowds or without problems in terms of safety and security. Because we were also trying to think about what kids need and how to make that valuable for them. So I think there's a lot of different ways in which you could choose to uh, apply these ideas in your own spaces. Um, I look forward to hearing your ideas along the way. I am going to keep doing these streams occasionally from City Skylines in terms of uh, the world builder elements itself. And uh, I really hope that you'll send in questions. Uh, you can always reach out to me, anything regarding Metaverse Media Futures, definitely hit me up. I'm gonna put my handle right here. Uh, so my personal handle is Emeration and my team uh, and all of us, you can reach at Playable Agency if you have particular types of projects that include some of these ideas. And that can be clean energy sprints, uh, looking at the relationship of resources in your community, biomimicry, but also looking at digital twins, especially, and thinking about how to apply some of these ideas to maybe a deliberative or a participatory design process in your community. So we're going to talk more about participatory design processes in future shows. And this is one of uh, seven cities I've built over the last uh, goodness month, I think. Um, but I'm going to uh, take us out with a different city that I've been working on that it, it just makes me happy, I have to say. Um, there, are, there are certain things about this type of process that are deeply meditative. And you'll find that each creative process is different depending on where you're at in the journey. Um, but here we are again in that city and I personally love coming up here to enjoy the fireworks at the end of the day. So I go and I'll sometimes just hang out and I'll look for the sunset and then I will come in and enjoy. And you get to decide like for you what that experience looks like. Rainy days, locked up, whatever makes sense. So, 
whether you're trying to build a real world or you're just thinking about how to apply these lessons in your own life, I hope you will definitely reach out. Uh, again, my name is Evo Haney. I am at Playable Agency. And also you can reach out to me at Amoration if you wanna reach out to me personally. And uh, we're gonna talk about uh, open metaverse and interoperability on metaverse media futures on sort of the key uh, principles and tenets of world building, but also on some of the experiments that we're running. And I hope that you will definitely reach out if there's anything that I can support you on the way. From all of us here, thanks for joining.